counts down to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Raise a glass of holiday cheer! Welcome back to the last comic shop! That's right, we're shoveling the walkway and opening the shop up to newbies in order to help them find their way under the comic book tent. And we're laying the salt down for the oldies to help them stay safe on that walkway and give them stuff to read and keep busy during this uh, cold, cold winter time. That's right. And I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson, and I'm joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott for another wonderful uh, review of a comic book that we read during our Christmas holiday break here. And we're going to now deliver to you. And it is very interesting in the fact that we started off season one of the last comic shop with a Tom King maxi series. And to finish off our season one of the last comic shop, we are ending with a Tom King maxi series, Strange Adventures, by Tom King, Mitch Gerard, and Doc Shaner. But before, because again, it is the end of our first season here at the Last Comic Shop, that we were going to do some numbers analysis. All the kids love data analysis. <laughs> That's true. Jim has been painstakingly using his time over this Christmas break to take all of our grades, all of those wonderful grades and ratings that we give our, our, our comic books all throughout this year, and basically compiling that data and giving it to you in a digestible form. So, Chad, what do we rate our books here in 2021 at the last comic shop? Okay, so here is the 2021 Last Comic Shop podcast review by the numbers. All right, let's start off overall, the whole big shebang, where we had 55 potential entries and uh, on our one to four scale, Andy, who rated all 55 entries, clocked in at a 2.95 average grade. Chad, who is me grading 55 entries, clocked in as the easiest grader at a 3.25 grade. J.A. Scott, after rating 54 entrance had a 3.03 average entry and what didn't i rate you gave an incomplete to the x-men versus fantastic four throwback show from our archives. ah so i had to listen to all the shows jay <laughs> all the shows <laughs> you act like that's a bad thing you should it, listen to all of our shows right come on it, it, it was delightful. And from our special guest reviewers, Mikey reviewed 10 things, had an average of 305. Lindsay Fahey uh, showed up for three ratings a, with a 2.33333 repeating. The lovely Nicole popped in for four different rating periods with a 2.96 average. Chris showed up twice for a 2.52. Alex popped in once for a three. Ethan showed up once for a two. And the wonderful Kaylin Smith came along one time, and she averaged a 4.0 rating. See, that's what happens when you get creators on the show. They just give everybody a free pass. That is not true at all. That was a good book. That was that was Paper Girls. That we all enjoyed that book. Come on. I think, uh, yes, I think we probably all gave it four, but I just. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that. There were actually seven times. Where we, meaning Andy, me, and J.A., where we actually all agreed on a rating. And in these seven times, three of them were all fours. And that went to Superman Smashes the Clan, Wonder Woman Dead Earth, and Reckless by Brubaker and Phillips. And I almost left out Silver Surfer Parable, which got fours from all of us, but a three from Mikey Wood. Mikey Wood! Hating on his Stan Lee. For our top 10 books, the top 10, starting at number 10, coming in at an average of 3.69, it's Monsters. Is that the Barry Windsor Smith one? Yes, that Barry is Barry Windsor Smith. At a 3.75, speaking of, with Silver Surfer Parable, our number 8 pick at 3.92, the New Mutants Demon Bear Saga. Number 7 at 3.92, my favorite thing is Monsters. Number six, also with a 3.92, so I guess those are all tied. It's Hawkeye Freefall. At a 3.94, we had Saga. Our number four pick was Hawkeye, which was the David Aja Matt Fraction pick that the show is based off of. 
which I love that show. We didn't talk about that show. It is delightful. <laughs> it is a delightful show. I just want to point out, I wonder, I, it, I'm going to deep dive into these numbers. I think Andrew is rating some of these shows lower because you and me were fours on most of these, I reckon, and Andrew is the one bringing down the average grade on I these I am the fair rater. You're a grumpy I'm a little grader. bit tougher of a critic sometimes, I won't lie. I, I will say... J.A., you brought the grade down one time for My Favorite Thing is Monsters. Otherwise, it was Andy. He was in it. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five times in the top ten, Andy had the lowest grade there. But our top three books for the year were Wonder Woman Dead Earth, Superman Smashes the Clan, and Reckless. So everybody loves the top ten books, but what about the bottom ten? Dun, dun, dun. So coming in at uh, number 40 in our ratings this year was Road to Perdition. <laughs> Coming in at 41 was Batman White Knight, which that was still a good book. It had all those Batmobiles in it. 42 was Why the Last Man. 43 was X-Men and Fantastic Four, which, as I said, J.A. had left it complete. 44 was Heroes Reborn that Andy loved, and the rest of us did not. 45 was Imperious Lex, DC Future State canon. 46 was Jack Kirby's New Gods. Number 47 was Dune, House of Treaties. 48 was the Suicide Squad comic. 49, Andy and I both gave it ones. And Jay liked it quite a bit more. It was X of Swords. I can't believe that one got so low. Why I know. did you guys keep that ones? That was awesome. Like 22 books, man. 22 <laughs> I books. Think it wasn't you, a lot. You, you guys were not rating the book. You were rating the experience. <laughs> Yes, and it was terrible. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't see no. the difference. Speaking it's of terrible life. experiences, do you guys know what the worst rated book was on our podcast? Oh, it has day? to be that Star Wars book. It's the, oh, the Star Wars. The Star Wars. It was the Star Wars. So, may the force of wills be with you or whatever it was. Yes, may the force of wills be with you. So out of the, t- the bottom ten, how many of books were my books? That is a great question. So, J.A., out of the bottom ten, you had one, two, three, four of the bottom ten. Wow. And then Andy had one, two, three, plus that archive show, which was his pick. I had two. All right. So, Chad yeah. picks the best books on this show. So, long story short, I if do. you listen to our show and you say it's a Chad pick, chances are you're probably going to get a decent book. And you know how else I can use the data to back that up? Our top 10 books picks one through six in terms of our rating. Uh, I'll pick by the Chadster. (laughs) So I I would also like to put out then. So not only was my book the least rated book ever or for this year, I I believe my pick is also the least listened to podcast as well for Cleveland. (laughs) Oh, that's true. Yeah, it is very true. Yeah, the Cleveland show is is a black hole in terms of listeners. (laughs) Nobody wants to listen to that show, which I'll get to in just a second. I do have our numbers on our top 10 shows of all time. But Chad, uh, in terms of publishers, right? Didn't you have some breakdown by publishers real quick? I do, just to show that we're relatively fair and balanced here in terms of how things shake out. As far as our average comic ratings for DC books, and this does include the Spider-Man Superman special, and DC also does include Road to Perdition, which they had published on one of their indie labels, but it was still DC proper. So we had ranked 13 DC books, which is a smaller number. Andy averaged a 2.71 grade for his DC books. I was the most favorable for DC at a 3.15. And J.A. clocked in at a 2.85. As far as our special guests, Mikey, our known DC lover, a four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I smell a little bias here. That's all I'm saying. For our indie books, we had 19 indie books. That included Andy averaging in at a 3.01. I had a 3.35. And J.A. had a 3.20. Turns out we all preferred the indie books we read uh, to those DC ones. And when it came to the Marvel books, Andy does have a Marvel bias out of the 19 Marvel books we read, which also includes that Spider-Man Superman special. Uh, Andy's average was a 3.12. 
giving him his highest ratings for Marvel books. My Marvel rating was a little bit lower than my Indies. It was 3.23, and J.A. was also lower than the Indies at a 3. But we did have considerably more Marvel books and, and indie books than DC books overall, right? I mean, I think it was, what, 19, 19, and 13? Yeah, that is correct. But yeah, so that's more because we had a whole Marvel month. We didn't do a DC month. Oh, well, you know what? We should rectify that. So starting this week with our strange adventures, be sure that you tune in for the next three weeks after this one. We'll be having a unofficial DC month. Yay! I'm sure Yay. everybody's excited about that. Why to way to kick off 2022. So so there. what three Batman books are we gonna read? <laughs> <laughs> I think actually on tap, the next uh, three weeks, they're all Superman books. So. It's gonna be a super time. And no, just to point out, because I know sometimes we're accused of having that uh, DC bias, two of our top three books were DC books. That's okay. true. When, when DC hits, it hits. That's going to do it for my numbers, but we do have one last set of numbers. But our very own Andy Larson has the download data, and so he's going to give us our final set of numbers with our top downloaded shows. Absolutely. So if you're uh, new to our show and you want a place to start, you might as well join the pack. Uh, we've had a wonderful 2021 here. Thousands of people have listened to our show over the past year. It's kind of crazy to think that uh, some of these shows have been listened to by thousands of people. So we thank everybody for being such great fans and coming back to the last comic shop every single week. These are our top 10 most listened to shows in 2021. So if you want places to start, these are some good suggestions. So number 10 is X-Men plus the Fantastic Four, one of our archive shows with our Fantastic Four as X-Men draft or X-Men as Fantastic Four draft. There you go. Cool. Coming in at number nine was Loki, Agents of Asgard by Al Ewing and Lee Garbett. At okay. number eight is the hockey uh, saga known as Essex County, uh, which I think was a J pick. So, I mean, again, it's one of the most listened to shows. Well, there we go. Uh, at number seven is our Taskmaster plus Black Widow movie review. So if you enjoyed the Black Widow movie, which you can watch on Disney Plus right now, uh, we've also give you a great Taskmaster comic by Jed McKay. Coming in at number six was Silver Surfer Parable. If you like some classic Stan Lee writing with Mobius art, make sure that you... T I think it's all because of that opening that we did with Mikey Wood where we pretended to be all the members of the Marvel bullpen. That, that's still one of my favorite opening segments. Number five was our review of Invincible. So those folks that enjoyed Invincible here in 2021, the cartoon series, make sure that you check out our review for the Invincible comic book by Robert Kirkman. Coming in at number four is Hawkeye Freefall. Yes, everyone loved our Hawkeye Freefall show. Matt Rosenberg and Otto Schmidt. We even got Otto Schmidt to send us a picture of Hawkeye with a coffee mug, which ended up being hugely popular on our Twitter page. So. Which he turned into the Homer Simpson meme when I asked, what am I getting my next Hawkeye series? <laughs> And our top three downloaded shows of all time. Number three, a review of Justice League, the Snyder Cut, uh, the four-hour thing. Uh, and number <laughs> two was our review of Wonder Woman uh, 1984. And our number one downloaded show of all time is our first episode of all time, which is a review of Tom King's Vision. And I feel like that's because people like to start at the beginning. And that is our first show. So, And there we go. And as a callback to our very first episode, which is a book written by Tom King, we're going to come right back after these announcements with another book by Tom King. Stay tuned for Strange Adventures. Hi, folks. This is Sean, this is Nerd Podcast. If you enjoy genuine conversation from two guys who love the subjects that they're talking about, you need to check us out. Honest to goodness conversation about the things that we love. Give us a listen. We're easy to find. Just search Pittsburgh Nerd on some of your favorite podcast catching apps. Or you can also check out our vlog on YouTube. Just search Pittsburgh Nerd. We're really, really easy to find. 
Cartoon Dumpster Dive. I'm your host, Joel. And I'm your host, Andrew. Join us as we travel back in time to watch the garbage cartoons from your past. Will you remember them? Maybe. We painstakingly watch every episode of these cartoons to remind you that, hey, some things belong in the past. Our pain is your entertainment. Thanks for tuning in. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for a Read Power Review. Yes, on our program, we actually do talk about comics and not just our fancy numbers <laughs> for the past shows. Uh, we like to give you new reviews of comic books that you can check out at your local comic shop today. And uh, again, we started off the season with a Tom King maxi series. We're going to end with a Tom King maxi series. And it is quite timely given this particular maxi series was just released in hardback just a couple of weeks ago. So if you don't want to uh, uh, track down the single issues, you can now get it in a nice hardcover collection. It, it comes out of DC's black label. It is the maxi series Strange Adventure that Tom King did with who, J.A.? Written, as you said, by Tom King with interior and cover art by Mitch Jareds and Doc Shaner and letters by Clayton Cowell. I remember at the time I was like, how are they going to do it with these two artists? Like sometimes we've talked on the last comic shop how that can be a little bit jarring going back and forth. But specifically, Mitch Jareds does all of the more contemporary current pieces and uh, Doc Shaner does all the flashbacks of Adam Strange's war on Rand against the Pikes. Is that how you pronounce it? Pikes? That's what I was saying, at least. Sure. And the pages are all set up. You know how Tom King loves his nine-panel grids. The pages are all divvied up by threes, and sometimes they split pages, sometimes they get the whole page. Lots of fun. And speaking of the war against the Pikes, J uh, Chad, why don't you give us the 10 cent synopsis for what happens in Strange Adventures? Okay, so Strange Adventures starts... Uh, with Adam Strange sitting at a table, welcoming you to his book signing for his new autobiography. And eventually in his book signing tour, uh, he meets a man who comes up and is very angry and starts yelling about what he did to the Pikes. Oh. Kind of awkward. But two days later, that man turns up dead. Ah. And so people think Adam Strange did it. And so he goes to Batman and says, I need you to investigate me, Batman. And Batman says, no. <laughs> I know another guy who will investigate you. Uh, he's a terrific candidate, and it turns out his name is Mr. Terrific. And so Mr. Terrific ends up investigating Adam Strange and his wife in terms of what has happened, what has he detailed in his autobiography, how does that autobiography match up with the truth of what happened, the stories that we actually tell versus the reality of the situation, and how does it all blend together into one messy thing, uh, which is split up by two different artists. But it is quite a strange adventure indeed. Yes. I will add that um, while this whole investigation is going on, the Pikes do come to Earth and try to take it over. So there's also like an invasion subplot that actually doesn't get a lot of play. Like it's it's in the background and you sometimes see it, but it's like it's like a side note, even though it's a massive invasion. Right. It's it's a side note and you know, spoiler alert, they just destroy Phoenix. There's no yeah. more Phoenix. But that's no. you know and and Flash shows up for like two panels and, and basically his entire job is to count dead people. <laughs> right. It's not what the book's about, but it is what the other book is about, with the whole fighting against the Pikes. And so it's sort of, they all blend together. But I thought it was weird, because I will say this, in other DC books, that would have been the whole storyline, is the invasion of the Pikes. And you would have had like 16 crossovers with other books, Flash, Pike Invasion. And you would have been like, oh, I spent a whole issue counting up the dead instead of like three panels. <laughs> yeah, indeed. This one, it's more about like, Adam Strange asking the Justice League for favors, and them awkwardly looking at him and be like, oh, uh, the Guardians wouldn't want me to do that thing, or, you know, I'm busy, I have to go fight in World World something, blah, blah, blah. They all come up with reasons why they don't want to help Adam Strange. I, this is going to be somewhat of a difficult book for me to give initial thoughts on, because there's a lot of, th this uh, book is actually dealing with the mystery of like, again, what Mr. Terrific is finding out about Adam Strange. And I don't know how much I want to give in terms of this particular book, but I will say this, 
talking about my curmudgeonly ways. This was a book I was very, very excited about. Just simply because Adam Strange is kind of a character I have a love-hate relationship with. I seem to like him and I don't like him. I like him because he's very similar to a character I love in Flash Gordon, right? Everybody knows I'm a huge Flash Gordon fan. So, like, I like Adam Strange because he's pretty much the DC equivalent to Flash Gordon. I hate Adam Strange because he's the DC equivalent of Flash Gordon. So it's like kind of giving, <laughs> getting like the dollar store version of Flash Gordon. It's like, oh, by the way, we're DC and we didn't have enough money to buy Flash Gordon from King Features Syndicate. So we'll just make our own character about some dude that goes off to some other planet and has like a brunette bombshell as his girlfriend and whatever. And, and it, at the end of the day, it's not as interesting. It never has been for me. But at the same time, I'm always curious. I'm like, when's that going to be that one series that puts it over the top? You know what I mean? It's like, that's the one series that's like, yes. And I was excited about this one because there's a great series out there done by Jeff Parker with Doc Shaner art called Flash Gordon, which if you've never read, you should check out. And so when I was thinking like, oh, wow, he's going to get to draw things that are very similar to Flash Gordon again, I was excited. And for those panels in this book, I am excited. The rest of it not so much. Oh, wow. wow. Not so much. And I will sum it up by saying this. I read two Tom King maxi series over my Christmas break this year, one of which I'm going to talk about in my recommendations with Rorschach. It's going to be a callback to one of the recommendations that Chad mentioned. The other one was Strange Adventures. And one of them was a deeply nuanced mystery that not only challenged you as a reader, but made you want to investigate the subject matter a little bit more. The other one was as formulatic as an episode of Columbo, and guess which one was Strange Adventures? <laughs> because wow. basically, at the beginning of the series, Mr. Terrific says what the mystery is. He says it within like the first issue or whatever, and it turns out to be accurate. <laughs> You know what the reveal is going to be from the beginning, and it's just Mr. Terrific putting together all the pieces. That's Columbo. That's all I'm saying. Well, you are Mr. Curmudgeonly, because you couldn't have been more wrong. Mm. Now, while the Doc Shaner art was nice and the throwbacks were great, you don't come for the Doc Shaner art. You come for the Mitch Jarrad's art. Beautiful, painterly, and every time he had a panel that was bigger than, a, you know, a quarter square... It just exuded passion and emotion and danger. I couldn't disagree with you more on this. I found the backstory to be painful, and I had to read through it quickly. I was much more interested in the current relationship between Adam Strange and his wife and what was going on. Though I did feel that Batman and Superman felt a little bit like they were just thrown in because they had to throw them in. I, yeah, I, I totally I felt, agree. I felt that they were like, why do we need Batman? I, I liked Mr. Terrific because he's not so much a, you know, a mainline DC hero. So that was interesting. It didn't take me out of it. I just every time like flash the three panels. Why? Uh, and I think you got Wonder Woman in space for like one panel. Oh, that sounds <laughs> like a good movie. Wonder Woman in space. In one panel. <laughs> in one panel. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing I did like about the throwback stuff was sort of the tongue-in-cheekness of it. I thought they were playing on that whole Flash Gordon aesthetic because all the big guns go boom and his laser pistol goes pew pew every time he's shooting it. And he's got all those uh, different races that are helping him out, like the rock men and then this, the, you know, and they, yes. they have the big maps of the entire planet and he's planning out all his invasion for it. it, it go on. Well, that was kind of interesting. That's not what kept me in the book and not what, like, it was a slow start for me like issues one two and three i was just like Ugh, this is gonna be one of those weeks but <laughs> by issue five six i was like oh i gotta keep reading this is getting interesting now so i didn't think it was formulaic or colombo or maybe it was and i just like colombo so no i i i think i'm on team j with this one and i think the biggest issue that this series had from the outset was dealing with my expectations because tom king and, and mitch jared's they produced Mr. Miracle, which is one of my favorite books of the last decade. And so when they announced they were doing the follow-up to Mr. Miracle together, like I was in and super pumped for it. And then they announced they were bringing in Doc Shaner 
to do some of the Silver Agey art on the book. And I was extra in because I love Doc Shaner and I love his art. And like, that is such my jam. And like, Andy will talk about peanut butter and chocolate all the time and the combination of those two things. This was great. And it was crazy to me how Doc Shaner's art and Mitch Gerard's art, they synthesized. Like, they would deal with overlapping issues. And so I didn't realize they were as similar as they were. It kind of blew my mind. Yeah, I agree with you because there were a couple of times when, especially on the three panel where they're time shifting between panels, I was like, wait a minute, is this the throwback or is this not? Because a lot of the faces were so similar. Yeah, and I think definitely there was an evolution here. In the first issue, Doc Shaner was very much so the Doc Shaner that I'm used to. And then as the series went, I felt like his art got a grittiness that went along with the tale. As the book went into the more graphic and gritty details, I thought Shaner's art you know, would rise up to that challenge. It was fun to watch the juxtaposition, the stuff that comes out of the book. And everybody knows that whenever you have these book accounts – from a, from a person it's always the glossed over version and so the book version is you know hi i'm adam strange and i'm here to protect this planet no matter what and it's all this silver agey fun and silliness it's that kind of energy and then that is contrasted with the mitch jareds it's a very modern take on comic books you have the wife elena and she's kind of like the brains behind the operation running a media campaign for adam strange as his name's being drugged through the mud and this is one of those things, and we'll talk about it too if we mention Rorschach, because it's already come up once, where I think like Tom King is trying to trying to tickle the zeitgeist. We're in politics these days, we have all these investigations that are ongoing. Politicians are, are having their press conferences and talking about these accusations as they go. That's what that felt like a, a lot for me, was dealing with those modern situations. And then seeing the contrast between what people would say in their book versus what's really happening behind the scenes. And it was really fun to, to watch that stuff. And so in addition to the story of Adam Strange being investigated for this murder, you also have this interplay of how the fiction matches the reality. Is it as stark of a contrast as it is here? Like, it just, it drudges up all these things. So I think if you're just looking at this as a, an episode of Columbo, I think you might be missing some of the subtext of what's going on inside. I thought this was really complicated. There are lots of layers here. Look, first off, I'm I'm going to be, you know, in regards to my initial thought, I mean, the, the art was terrific. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say that the art wasn't terrific. That that wasn't my issue with the book. I think that Mitch Gerards did a wonderful job. I think that Doc Shaner and all what you said about the art, I, I agree with. I, I think what this comes down to is the fact every single time I'm brought to a Tom King book, I always compare it, I guess, to other Tom King books, right? Like, is Tom King Stephen King in terms of comic books? Does he keep on hitting home runs out of the park all the time? Or is he more like Michael Crichton, in which he's like, oh, you know what? He wrote uh, Jurassic Park, and that was really good. You know, that's like his Mr. Miracle or his vision. And then, hey, he wrote Sphere. And you're like, okay, that was all right. <laughs> sure, whatever. I read it because I read Jurassic Park and I enjoyed it. And so every single time I read Tom King, I'm like, is this some sort of upper echelon book? And again, from my perspective, even though you're talking about subtext and things, I just couldn't shake the fact that this seemed very formulaic. Sure, he's got a couple good character moments on that. I mean, you end up really liking Mr. Terrific. You're like, well, this Mr. Terrific guy, he sure actually is terrific. And... I would like to see a series about him. And maybe, yeah, you start off by thinking like Adam Strange. Yeah, he's one of those Silver Age guys. But yeah, he's kind of a terrible person. To be yeah, honest, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's part of it too, though, is even in the autobiography portions, like you see Adam Strange get worse and worse in the throes of war and the sacrifices that he's willing to make in life. The parts of his humanity that he leaves behind. There's that one scene where he's fighting in the pit against that alien uh, who's about to kill him. And Adam Strange is there and he's, you know, kind of playing like the, the lame duck. And it's it's not a heroic move, but he draws the guy in and trips him and then beats up to death with his helmet. And you see the rage in his eyes as he's pulling the helmet down to crash in and destroy this alien thing. 
in defense of himself and his family and all this other yeah, stuff. Yeah, he didn't just beat him to death. He decapitated him. Like, oh, and it's so visceral. And, like, it gets redder and redder and redder. And you see that just the look in his eyes. Oh, oh. I was going to say, though, but I've seen this take on Adam Strange before. There was a series written in the in the 1990s called Adam Strange, Man of Two Worlds. It only is lasted for three issues, but it basically kind of tells tries to tell like a vertigo version of Adam Strange, where like he goes back to Earth and meets up with some girl there and brings her back to Rand. And like Elena ends up dying in childbirth and like he has to raise this child by himself. And it kind of tries to demystify a Silver Age character. So I've kind of went through this notion of like Adam Strange being, you know, hey, Silver Age guy, but he's really just a jerk. And that's really what you get here. So like that wasn't anything new to me. I've kind of seen this before and somebody else's take on it. And I wasn't really interested then. I'm not really interested now. And so I'm here for the mystery. I'm here for what else you're going to bring me, Tom King. It ended up being more a story about, I don't know, the relationship between Elena and Mr. Terrific. And at the end, what's up with that? She's just like, yeah, Mr. Terrific, you got to do this. And I'm not going to give away what Mr. Terrific has to do. But if I was Mr. Terrific, I'd be like, no, dude. Like, I don't know why <laughs> yeah. you're pinning this on me. Like, I'm not your surrogate husband now. It was the weirdest thing in the world. And like, I don't know where it came from. I, I, I feel like I'm giving it away if I say what it was. But it was like a left turn. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on the end. The end was sudden and very, very like, sort of out of left field. Though I think yeah. when you, it, it just was too abrupt. It could have been done better. I, I get the notion of what he was trying to do. And I think they just didn't explain sort of the backstory for Mr. Terrific, why he needed to do it. Not the justification, not because A, because B, because C, now you have to do D. But I think Elena was trying to – she should have been convincing him like, oh, because of everything that happened in your life, because you lost this or because you're stronger now, you have to take on this. Right. It's like they left an issue out that would have really gone into the Mr. Terrific side to to make that make sense. The Mr. Terrific backstory I think needed to be fleshed out more. But I did like their interplay. I like their interplay. The last, I thought the last two issues were the strongest of the series. The issue where Elena and Adam are fighting as a married couple in the house. And then the issue where she goes uh, with Mr. Terrific to the alien base. There you go. I was, I was impressed with how far they go to leave that teaser out there. Even in a black label book, which may or may not be continuity. Nobody knows or cares about that stuff anymore. But I, I was surprised the lengths to which they did that thing. Um, and I also was impressed with how well they built up Elena and Mr. Terrific. As characters, yes. I, I want more Elena stories. She oh, was yeah. a badass. I, the whole fact that she's got to smoke cigarettes because the, the air on Earth stinks to her alien lungs is just cool. But I, I don't know. There was just some piece of this that just... And again, maybe it was because I was reading, unfairly, Rorschach at the same time, which I'm going to again, I'm going to talk about in, in my recommendation. And maybe I was unfairly comparing it, the two. Because I, I do feel, as I'm going to get to in a second, that Rorschach is up there with things like Mr. Miracle and Vision in terms of books that challenge you and make you want to read more and things like that. This one was just like, I don't need to read anything more than this series. I don't need to think about, even with Chad's point, with like the little quotes at the end, I was just like, yeah, should I be paying attention to these? Nah, whatever. Let's get on to the next issue. And unfortunately, that was the case, because again, I just, it didn't engage me. And maybe it's because, like a Columbo plot, they told me what the mystery was from the start. So there was nothing more to... To, to dive into and maybe somebody could say that was the same thing for the Rorschach book I don't know I don't think the Rorschach book was about the mystery it was about oh man it was about the realizations of the guy that was investigating it if that was why I, let me hit the pause button on you because I feel the exact same in the opposite direction we need to have this Rorschach conversation at some point because when you sent that message you sent a message about your Columbo thing and I thought, oh, he's obviously talking about Rorschach, because that was the book that 
I think I've come down that wasn't as good. Mm. Like the mystery on Rorschach isn't really a mystery, and ah, uh, you know, it's kind of a waste of time and hodgepodge, mumble jumble. Whereas this one, I'm like, oh, what? Like I, I kept digging in and I kept finding more things and like. So it's equal but opposite here. Well, then, if that's the case, then let's quickly get to that recommendation section so I can talk about Rorschach a little bit. We'll be right back with our ratings of Strange Adventures and more talk about Rorschach, potentially. We'll see right after these messages. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Palatichuk. I'm an independent film director and screenwriter. I'm also an independent comic book artist and creator. I want to let you know about my podcast, The St. Paul Filmcast. It's a weekly podcast where I interview other independent filmmakers and other artists from the Twin Cities area. You can find the show on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, and Amazon Radio, as well as our distributor, Podbean. You can follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So, if you're interested in how independent films get made or the process of filmmaking, also, if you're interested in other artists' process and works as well, tune into my show, The St. Paul Filmcast, where it's not over till the guests say it's over. back with more of the last comic shop and it is now time for our rating yes the final rating of 2021 not included in all of chad's numbers because obviously we haven't given it yet but as we often do we like to rate our particular books as who knows maybe strange adventures will be uh, a victim of my curmudgeonliness <laughs> as now i will as become... many books have come before so jay scott gives us that one out of four scale and what is it for this week jay one out of four laser pistol sounds. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> uh, those were good pew pews. I like pew pews. And speaking of pew pews, we'll start off with J.A. Scott, his uh, rating and final thoughts on Strange Adventures. How many pew pews are you giving it? I'm giving this a solid three pew pews. <laughs> took a little bit to get into, and I felt that Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman and Flash were kind of forced in because I think they kind of felt they had to put them in to make it a DC book. I think you get rid of the Batman character. You don't you just reference him a bit and it could have been a stronger book. And I will agree with Chad. I think they needed to go a little bit more in depth uh, into Mr. Terrific's backstory to make that left turn in the last issue a little bit less jarring and, and more realized. That being said, the art is fantastic. The way it jumps between Mitch Jarrod's and Doc Shaner's forward and backward in time. And whenever they make this movie, obviously Olivia Munn is going to be playing Elena because <laughs> Mitch Jarrod's draws her exactly like Olivia Munn. Every time I saw her, I was like, oh, that's Olivia Munn. <laughs> well, there you go, DC. Jay's already doing your casting. Uh, Chad, who would you cast Elena as? <laughs> oh, geez, I don't know. You would need someone uh, strong and powerful. Give me uh, another decade and give this to Gal Gadot. But uh, Elena was great in this. Whew. I, you just fall in love with her in this book. She's awesome. It's, oh. But that brings me to my rating. And for this particular book, boy, do I love all the, the, the work of all the participants. I love Tom King. I love Mitch Jarrods. I love Doc Shaner. And this book I thought was a quality book. I enjoyed the experience. I read through it very quickly. I read it again. I was looking for those little details. And I do think it tickles the zeitgeist a little bit with things that are, are bubbling around in the popular culture and really reflecting what's going on in our times. And those deeper themes of the fictions we make up and how they match up with the reality and what's better. And at the end of the day, you know, you get that scene and it mirrors the, the opening scene about it at the book signing. But now we're back to the fictionalized version instead, like... It was just, it was really cool to see that play out in the comic book art form. And I definitely think this is a worthwhile experience. But with that said, it did not live up to my expectations. And I, that part's really unfair of me. I, I think King and Jared's did a great job. I think Doc Shaner did a great job. 
And as Doc Shaner's art progressed and it got grittier, I liked it less and less. Mm. But that's not because it wasn't good. It's not because it didn't fit the story. It absolutely did. It did the things that it was supposed to do. But it disappointed me because I just I love that Silver Age Doc Shaner art. I don't want him to evolve. I want him to go more like Alex Toth, not less. And I do think the story in the end, it, it, it ends too abruptly. There were too many pieces of it that I'm like, well, that was too easy. And they just destroyed Arizona and no one gave a darn. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't um, even Mesa. It, I mean, it was like Phoenix. You know, Mesa, maybe people don't care about, but Phoenix is... Yeah, hugely populated. Like, that would be a, a much bigger deal. And th- there are too many missteps here. So I'm going to go 3.25. I, I think it's good. I think it's solid. I think it's worth pursuing. But I don't think it's the best I've seen from any of the creators involved. Uh, it failed to live up those expectations. And, and I think that's where I'm going to come with, with my rating as well. Because, uh, again... I think the issue with this particular book is every single time Tom King's wrote a a series that I've liked, he's taken a character that I liked beforehand or had some interest with and elevated that character even further. Like, for example, with Vision, I'm a huge Vision fan. He took Vision and elevated him to the next level. Mr. Miracle, he did the same thing with. Adam Strange is a character that I've enjoyed. Sure, he's like a dollar version of Flash Gordon, but that doesn't make him any less of a character that I enjoy because I like Flash Gordon. I like Adam Strange. He didn't do that with this particular series. And I think that's where my disappointment comes from. And that's unfortunate that maybe my rating is going to be brought down because I'm comparing work to other works that, from the same guy. I mean, I will say that the Mitch Gerard art, the, the Doc Shaner art, it was wonderful. If I'm just rating it on art, it's a four out of four. You should check this book out for no other reason than the art. But if you're coming here for Tom King's writing and taking a character and being elevated to that next level, he doesn't do it with Adam Strange. He maybe does it with Mr. Terrific, but I don't care about Mr. Terrific. Dare I say he takes a throwaway character, just throws him away. (laughs) That's true. That's true. He does. And uh, again, that's why I think my my deep seated disappointment comes from because I was expecting, again, that vision or that Mr. Miracle. And I didn't get that. I did get that with Rorschach. So that's what my recommendation is based on. I'm going to give this a 2.75 because, again, it can't be less than a two because of the art. The art is, again, a four out of four. But if you're talking about the writing, it's formulatic. It takes a character you don't care about at the beginning and you still don't care about at the end unless you're talking about Mr. Terrific or Elena. Those characters you actually do care about by the end. But Adam Strange, you don't care about his journey. He's supposed to be like, I don't know, a, a martyr or, a, or oh, look how far this guy has fallen. I don't care how far Adam Strange fell in this book. He could have fell another 10 steps. He was a sub-character in his own book. <laughs> and Before we go, I want, since we're all talking about disappointments, I want to tell you one more thing I'm disappointed in. This series artfully combines two of the best artists working in comic books today, and it made me choose every month on which cover I was going to buy. <laughs> oh, you got two covers. You got a Doc Shaner cover or a Mitch Gerrard's cover. Yes, and that is not fair. It is not fair. And I am really upset at the comic industry in general with all these variant covers especially for something like this where it's like if you see the Mitch Jarrett's covered in number one and the Doc Shaner covered in number one, like they work so well together. You need to give me both covers. Even if it's just a little picture on the inside, I felt cheated, DC, Mr. Black Label. I feel like I'm not getting the full experience because you're hiding some of the best work from some of the best artists. But making me pick a cover is like trying to choose a choose a child. <laughs> Because you're making me choose a gosh darn cover, and there's another one out there that's just as good. Ah! I think DC wanted you to buy both. <laughs> They're not getting me that way either. You're not playing the game. Oh, Look, I, I was I, I was disappointed done. in this series simply because Adam Strange was going to be the bad guy, but they telegraphed that Adam Strange was the bad guy from the start. Mm. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say he's the bad guy. I think that's too black and white. He's oh just... no, it was black and white that he was the bad guy. No, like he no, was like not, oh but, I'm the and, bad and, guy. And, I'm the, he's not a bad guy, guy, though. 
He's, huh? bad he's a bad guy, but he's not the bad guy. I'm the blonde superhero. I'm the bad guy. And it's just like, really? That's that's kind of it's kind of been done. <laughs> he's a bad guy. He's not the bad guy. <laughs> the Pikes weren't even the bad guy compared to him. They destroyed Arizona. They're bad. <laughs> and nobody cared. Yeah. Nobody cared about was, the fact they destroyed it. That's because nobody cares Phoenix. about the Pikes either. <laughs> they don't get stories or language or anything. They're just there. Nameless, faceless, blah, 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 blah. And that's not good. That's not good for Tom King writing. I just, I, I'm going to call a spade a spade on that. Any case, what I'm also going to call is our recommendations this week. It's finally time to recommend other books in addition to Strange Adventures that you can get in hardback now at your local comic book shop. So we're going to go ahead and start off with J.A.'s pick this week so ja what do you have for us in terms of recommendations so this one is right up chad's alley because it's got that beautiful silver age looking art by doc shaner uh writing by jeff parker and uh, i guess jordy belair did the colors uh flash gordon the man from earth this is from dynamite press it is uh their first trade out there you can get it on comiXology and it is Flash Gordon going off to the planet Mongo. He's going up against the tyrant Ming the Merciless, of course. You get all the classic characters, Dale Arden, Dr. Zarkov, and there's the Beastmen of Aboria and Hawkman of Sky City. It's just all these classic stuff that you would have had in the old 1950s and 1940s Flash Gordon movies done in a much more modern way but with that just beautiful art so if you like the throwback portions of strange adventures then this book is right there right up your alley yeah, I, I could not agree more and i think andy will chime in too we've talked about that book before and we love it we, we often talk about comic booking at its finest like that series is so good it ended way too early yeah I mean, you want to talk about uh, taking a a blonde superhero from the 1930s and actually giving you reasons to care. That Flash Gordon book does. Like, they give Flash Gordon such an interesting personality in that book where he's kind of like like a doofus daredevil, but like... Meathead. Yeah, but like in a way that's charming and like endearing. And you've got Dale rolling her eyes all the time and Dr. Zarkov drinking constantly. Yes. And they explain where all of the animal men come from, from like Mongo, why there are lion men and all these other things. And so Jeff Parker just weaves all of those parts of this Flash Gordon mythology into something that actually is cohesive and makes sense. And you're like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of it that way, but that's why you would do that. And and so, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. That's one of my favorite books in the last decade myself. Like, I love that Flash Gordon series. Great pick. So I'm also going to pick something uh, from a similar bet. I'm going to go back with Tom King and Mitch Jarrett's the first time I'm aware of them working together on a maxi series. Uh, And this is back when Vertigo was still Vertigo. It is Sheriff of Babylon. And this is very much so a more real life story, uh, which was based on King's time that he served in Iraq. And so it's very intense very realistic. I don't want to give too much away, um, but it's 12 issues. It is definitely worth tracking down and, and something that I would highly recommend. So it's got a lot of Bedouins in it because they live in tents. Uh... <laughs> 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 All right. Well, yeah, I have actually not checked out Sheriff of Balabon, so maybe that'll be the next series I, I, I take a look at because... Um, it's been on my read pile stack for a while, but I just never got around to it. So recommendation for last, because we've teased it several times through the show, and that is revisiting a recommendation that Chad made several weeks ago when he said, I read Tom King's Rorschach, and I don't know if it's any good. Well, I'm here on today's program to say it is great. You should read Tom King's maxi series, 12 issues uh, with the wonderful Jorge Fornes. Fornes, yeah. Uh, art. It is just something that if I mentioned on today's show about Tom King taking a character that I liked and like elevating him to the next level, he did that with Rorschach, even though it's not even the Rorschach, the the Walter Kovacs version uh, from the original Watchmen. It's some other version of Rorschach, which again 
you listen to that old show, is kind of a, a, an analog to Steve Ditko in some strange way. Uh, no, it's it's just Steve Ditko. I mean, <laughs> that's what it is. But he also has a sidekick and called The Kid, and she's got a really interesting story. Um, but it's basically about these two people trying to assassinate the, the standing president, who I think is Robert Redford. I think that's where it comes yeah. from, right? It's set up in both the original Watchmen series and if you're a fan of the HBO uh, show Watchmen. Basically, this is kind of a little bit of a sequel to that. So if you've watched that show like I did, you know, follow-ups to that, like, say, Dr. Manhattan being assassinated and all this other stuff. But it's basically this detective that's been hired to figure out why they tried to assassinate Robert Redford. And again, unlike the mystery that evolved in Strange Adventures, this made me want to go out. And find out more. Like, I was like, ooh, why is Otto Bender in this book? Why is Frank Miller in this book? Why did he make, you know, the Rorschach be Steve Ditko? And what does Steve Ditko's adoption of the philosophy of uh, Randism have to do with everything? And his Mr. A series that came out before the question. How do all these pieces inter- interconnect? And at the end, when the detective finds out everything and he's got this great issue where he stands naked in front of Rorschach and he puts it all together as to what he's supposed to do next. I thought it was one of the best issues of comic books I read all year as this guy is just trying to come to peace with the mystery that he's just unraveled and go, yep, this is what I got to do. That's what we were missing in Strange Adventures. That's what we didn't get with Mr. Uh, Terrific saying like, these are the consequences of what I've discovered. He didn't care what happened to Adam Strange or Elena as a result of his investigation. He was just like, I'm just going to investigate this. And here's the truth. Fair play. And I was like, that's that's cheating. And I thought right, that you got I've Go recommended ahead. Rorschach. You've recommended Rorschach. I think we're going to have to put a pin in it. We need to know what Jay thinks about Rorschach. So stay tuned for 2022, gang. We'll come back with a brand new season. And I'm certain we'll get to Rorschach at some point along the way. Absolutely. Yeah. J.A.'s got to read it now and and be the deciding vote. Yay or nay on Rorschach. And I hope that you make sure that you tune in for that future show by rate reviewing and subscribing out at www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. We're going to be back for season two of our terrific podcast where we give you comic books that you should check out in your spare time. So make sure that you check us out on all of those podcasting platforms. I'm not going to list them all here. We're on everything, though. So make sure that you go out to www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. You'll find links to all of them, including YouTube. We've got all of our episodes out on youtube so it's very easy to listen to our show every week and if you're inclined to make sure that you leave us a five-star review right i mean at the end of the day we want to make sure that our podcast is found by other folks so leaving us a review helps other people see our show and say yeah this is something i should check out there you go and if you want to find us on the socials to continue the conversation maybe you want to vote in our wednesday polls or check out those cool daily bits of trivia or factoids or issues we found in the buck bins, whatever it is out there, you can find us on the Twitter and the Instagram at last comic shop. You can always go back to our website, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com where they can find what else, J.A.? Oh, they can get a link to our merch store. Uh, we've got a special Christmas edition Last Count Myself t-shirt, sweatshirt, whatever, tote bag, scarf maybe. But it will only be available until the end of the year. So if you have any last minute Christmas shopping or you forgot to buy grandma a gift, now you know where to go. And besides, you can just put it in a box and you can wear it next Christmas, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you're getting a, a, a jump on next Christmas's present shopping already. There you there go. There you go. And you know where you can wear that? To your local comic shop. Don't know where to find a local comic shop? Go to the Comic Shop Locator, www.comicshoplocator.com, where you can find a place that might be able to sell you some strange adventures. Get yourself some strange. And while you're there, see if you can get some Flash, too, to go with it, a.k.a. Flash Gordon, or maybe some Rorschach, or maybe the Sheriff of Babylon. There you go. And I will say that your time, those tote bags, great to carry around your new comic book day pickups. Make sure that you get a last comic shop tote bag just for that, right? Right. And they're, they're built so strong, you can even carry around an Omni or two. <laughs> oh, the Omnibus. Maybe we'll have to cover some Omnibuses next year. Oh, my gosh. That's going to be some reading. But again... 
Tune in for season two starting next week. Until then, I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson. I'm joined by Chad Smith and J.A. Scott. And we hope you have a wonderful new year. Until then, stay safe, stay sheltered, and may old acquaintance be forgot. Make sure you don't forget to tune into The Last Comic Shop next year. Cheers. The Last Comic Shop was a 2021 Black Angus production.